this topic, standing with our neighbors, is something that is really close to my heart. Right? As somebody who grew up as a racial and religious minority in my hometown. So I, before we begin, I'd like you to turn to somebody, hopefully somebody that you maybe don't already know their name. There are many reasons and uh, many ways that people feel welcomed or unwelcomed. And I want to just give you a little bit of background and context um, about myself and where I'm coming from today. I actually grew up not very far from here in Edwardsville, Illinois. Anybody know where that is? Yes. Art therapy programs here. I did not know that when I was going there. So my family immigrated there when I was six months old, and um, I, I moved around in many different states. I actually, and I live in Valparaiso now, Indiana, which is about 60 miles east of here, if you're not familiar with that. Um, so in Southern Illinois, we were probably one of a handful of families of color and immigrant families. And so for me, you know, I grew up in a Hindu household, learned about reincarnation, read comic books about Krishna, went to temples in bare feet, not in Illinois, but in <laughs> People were kind, and eventually I did make friends, but there were subtle and overt ways that I felt excluded. And many of my classmates, particularly in grade school and I think all throughout primary school, saw me as different not just because of the color of my skin, but also because we didn't worship Jesus. So I remember times when Christian missionaries knocked on our doors, handing out brochures saying, beware of practices like yoga and Hinduism, they're the devil. Our family spoke another language. My mother wore saris when we went to events. We had different food, um, you know, listened to different kinds of music. So these experiences gave me the first taste of feeling like an outsider, that somehow I was <laughs> less than the people around me. So that was just the seeds of some experiences. And I, I, had many more wonderful and very difficult experiences of discrimination, but I wanted to just bring the focus back to our clients or patients, um, people that we work with, who have even uh, more tragic experiences. So I don't know if any of you have read the book, The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down. Anybody sound familiar? Yeah, so this book describes the um, treatment of Leah, a mom child who had epilepsy. So she started having seizures and was taken to the hospital and treated with standard Western medical procedures, pharmaceuticals, but the family didn't speak English and there was no translator available. So what happened was the family didn't give her the medication that was prescribed on a regular basis. And so authorities decided that this family was being neglectful and removed Mia from their care for one year and put her in foster care where she had a, brain, a seizure that led to a lifelong brain injury. So, you know, this situation, obviously very tragic situation, highlights the need for these six qualities of culturally responsive practice that I'm going to talk about today. So these practitioners, doctors, <coughs> were sensitive on the surface to the fact that, oh, well, this is a family that doesn't speak English. What are we going to do? So that was an obvious difference. But they neglected to find out the information and the knowledge that they needed to look into different understandings of illness, of medicine in, in the Hmong culture, um, the rationale for medical treatment. Um, they didn't understand the need to explain that. 
they didn't understand Hmong values around healing. And if they did, they would have realized that epilepsy was seen as a spiritual illness where the soul becomes separated from the body. And later they found out that the parents saw their daughter's condition as a spiritual gift and a possible prophecy that she might become a shaman. And that was the reason they didn't always give her the medication. So because they made these assumptions, they were unable to demonstrate any sense of cultural empathy for this family. And if they had engaged in cultural humility, they might have realized that perhaps their assessment and treatment of this daughter and family may not be the best way, there may be better ways. So at the time, they weren't able to engage in any cultural self-reflexivity. And, you know, to be fair, this book is written from a doctor's perspective, and it sounds like a very difficult and stressful situation, like many people were trying to do the best that they could. So, but later, after they had a chance to reflect, and at least the doctor who wrote this book, it's clear she did engage in some cultural self-reflexivity, even admitting that their lack of understanding and cultural knowledge may have caused her brain damage. And they, lastly, they missed a larger perspective, culturally responsive perspective that looks at entire systems and larger perspectives. For instance, um, the inst institutions and systems of Western medicine and spiritual perspectives. So these are the six qualities that I want to talk about today. The, the inner fears, larger realities that we need to wake up to and pay attention to in order to effectively respond and support those who are discriminated and excluded that we work with. So, and my promise today is that we have to engage our whole selves. We have to engage our mind in developing cultural sensitivity and cultural knowledge. We have to strengthen our heart in developing cultural empathy and cultural humility. And we have to engage our spirit or a larger perspective in developing cultural self-reflexivity and responsiveness. So hopefully we'll have there'll be a few moments for you to interact and uh, I'm gonna share some stories or some research along the way. Feel free to um, maybe write down some questions that you have along the way. We'll have time for that at the end. I hope nobody has motion sickness. <laughs> Sometimes crazy can do that. So our mind, it's more than just our brain, right? It includes the capacities of our brain, but also our consciousness. So I think of that when we're operating out of this kind of positive aspect of our mind, we're we're observing with curiosity or without judgment. We're collecting information and gaining wisdom along the way. Right? And so the, the risk is that we, if we only focus on kind of these qualities or just our mind or our intellect, we can be at risk for using the information that we learn to stereotype or make assumptions <coughs> about other people, our clients, patients, coworkers, colleagues supervisees, right? So under this category, I've put cultural sensitivity and knowledge. So cultural sensitivity, this term is used very loosely. I'm more specifically defining these terms today, so you might hear different definitions. I'm defining this today as basically just the first step in being sensitive that yes, there are cultural differences that exist, social differences that exist, that we not we are not all the same. We can't treat everybody in a universal way. And it might seem like something that's very obvious, but I felt it was important to put this here because 
A few years ago, I worked with a supervisee from Taiwan who had recently immigrated to the United States. And she had only studied classical piano, European classical piano. She wasn't familiar with very many styles of popular music. So when her professor assigned an initial music therapy assignment and said, let's start with an improvisation assignment using the blues, a genre that everybody's familiar with. <laughs> She wasn't, she had no idea what the blues were. And because of her Taiwanese cultural norms to defer to her professor as an authority figure and not ask questions, she didn't know how to handle this. So she brought it to me. And clearly her instructor didn't have this basic cultural sensitivity that, oh, everybody may not understand the blues, may not be familiar with this. So we know that it's the first step, but it's not enough. We got to go further than that. So the next quality that I've put under this category of the mind is cultural knowledge or being informed about the information that's relevant to the particular social cultural groups that the people that we work with are a part of. So this can include any of the things that I've, I've posted here, values, norms, communication styles. It can also include, you know, do our clients see the world from an individual or a collective perspective? How do they express their emotions? How do they see gender roles? Are they strict or are they fluid? And then how does each person relate to those norms? How do they relate to art forms and what's the meaning of those art forms in their particular groups that they're a part of? So there are a lot of resources written about this information. It's, it's kind of infinite. I mean, there's, you know, with, with billions of people on the planet, um, you know, this is, this is just the beginning. And there are several books in music therapy. We have a recent book, Cultural Intersections in Music Therapy, edited by Annette whitehead Clo and Shirley Tam. There's also another book that I like to use, Ethnicity and Family Therapy. Um, so those have a lot of really specific information about particular social cultural groups. Right. Art forms, I'm going to play just a brief piece for you and ask you if you recognize this and if anybody knows the background. this piece for my grandmother, 
who lives in India and grew up during British colonization, she's gonna have a very different experience of this, right, than somebody who's used to thinking, oh, what a pretty Christmas song. And this is a piece, an arrangement by Vaughn Williams. This um, theme is used in the Vanya method of guided imagery and music as a common, you know, um, common piece in the program. And there's a GIM therapist, Allison Short, who wrote an article and talked about yet another context where she played this piece with an Australian client. And in Australia, apparently, this song is used on ice cream trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the middle of a you know, guided imagery music session, she's visualizing the music in this deep place and suddenly she hears green sleeves. <laughs> and she says, oh my goodness, there's that creepy person in the ice cream truck. <laughs> so, right, so we also have to be aware of what's the information in the context of the art forms that we're using. I have another example for you. I, in my research, I used a, an adaptation of the um, Bayou method. It's called Culturally Centered Music and Imagery. And I had a participant who was a gay South Indian immigrant. And I played the air from this famous Bach orchestral suite. I did it specifically because I wanted to just see what his reaction was going to be to this music. So let me just play a brief example of that. So very popular piece, you might recognize it. And as he was listening to it, he first said, oh, it feels so soothing and comfortable. It's, I imagine these two people dancing in this very romantic way, and they're looking in each other's eyes. And then he said, the white people, <laughs> and it's from the Victorian age. <coughs> and as he, visualized that he had a few different responses and one was afterwards i don't know why i visualized white people in in the victorian age and obviously this music is from that era and so then as soon as he made that connection he started remembering oh yeah when i moved here immigrated here to this country for the first time i experienced a lot of discrimination so that was the part of the context of how he experienced this music. So the last thing I'll say about knowledge is that as we are gaining knowledge, learning about other cultures, we have to be careful that we use that knowledge respectfully, right? That we don't culturally appropriate it. A peer of mine, when I was in graduate school, who practiced some indigenous uh, practices, she was a white American, argued with me that I didn't own my ancestors' meditation practices and she had a right to practice whatever she wanted. Right, and as music therapists, we use drums and drum circles, we use, we borrow music and our forms, art forms, on a regular basis. And it's interesting to think about that as music therapists, we have to follow copyright law. And if a piece of music is copyrighted, we know that in order to use it in public, we have to pay for a license to be able to do that. But often that gets forgotten if it's a religious chant or a spiritual practice or something like a, you know, a rhythm or a drum from another country. So. We need to treat it with the same level of respect, right? Ask for permission, be mindful about the practices that we use. Now, another piece 
of this is that as we're gathering information about specific groups, everybody from each group doesn't necessarily follow those norms or relate to those norms in the same way. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. This is a, like, could be a talk all on its own. But this is essentially about ethnic and racial identity processes and development that essentially that there's a process there's a process of development that some of these stages involve at the beginning for instance what's called a pre-encounter that might mean somebody who doesn't necessarily relate to their social or cultural group and norms it might even be somebody who's denying it in a really significant way. So one example is Carolyn Kenny, who a, was a pioneer indigenous music therapist who recently passed away, wrote about how her own mother denied her Native American heritage in dramatic ways. And this is what she said about her mother. Abandoned by her own Native mother at the age of three, she spent most of her life wanting to make life easier by trying to be white. She bleached her skin. She broke and reset her nose. She put aside all things Indian. Never mind that her father also had an Indian mother, a fact that most of our family tried to ignore or deny. Right, so sometimes it's so painful the amount of discrimination that people are experiencing. They have so much internalized oppression that they're not able to do that. So on the flip side, we might have people that we work with who are very angry. They're starting to wake up to discrimination. I remember being in that place when I moved to Boulder, Colorado for the first time and started experiencing some more overt racism. I was being followed around in a, in a store, you know, um, for fear that I was going to steal something. So we have to recognize that if we have a client or a coworker or a supervisee who has a lot of anger about this, that we give them the space to do that. Right? That it's just it's an important stage and place. So there are many complex variations of this. Um, and so you get an idea of what this might look like. And at the very end of this particular model, there's a stage where somebody feels integrated, they're connected to their own identity, but also um, they're able to kind of be in the world and be with others who are in different groups. So there are a few just brief, more complex identities that I'm just going to touch on that you should be aware of that, again, not everybody necessarily fits into those identity models. Somebody might also have an, more than one significant and marginalized identity. So, for instance, the participant I was telling you about who listened to the Bach and had that reaction to the to the, about the Victorian people dancing. Um, I played another piece for him, and I'll just put that on briefly. And he had told me, oh, I like any kind of chanting music and emotional music. It doesn't matter what language it is. It's all very soothing to me. So I put this on. very typical um, 
Indian classical music form, and then there's chanting that comes in in the language of Sanskrit. And as soon as I put this on, he said, oh, um, I'm imagining myself in a temple, and they're chanting Sanskrit, and I'm not allowed to go in. And what I didn't realize and should have known is that he was from a different caste, a lower caste, which is like a different class categories. And there's discrimination, a lot of discrimination based on caste, and there's also discrimination based on socioeconomic status. So his experience was he wasn't always allowed to go into these temples and pray when he wanted to because he either didn't have enough money to you know, pay for blessings um, or he wasn't allowed to because of his caste. So you can see that, so his relationship with his ethnicity became very complex. He was gay, he had this caste discrimination, but at the same time, he loved his mother country. And, and yet when he lived here, he, you know, he felt more supported by being able to be out and be queer, but um, he was also experiencing discrimination at the same time. So his experience became very complex. So just a little bit to touch on that, that we have to recognize that everybody's experiences are, are unique and there are different maps that can help us learn more about what our clients and super rats and zerts are going through. Okay, so at the level of the heart, I'm going to keep moving here and then I've got a couple of experiences uh, that I'm involved in. So cultural empathy and cultural humility, right, center around connecting with our heart. We talked about the information piece. And we just have to be careful that we don't focus on having a surface level kindness and that remember that being kind is not always necessarily the solution, right? So we need to gather information and we need to look at having a deeper level of empathy. So cultural empathy is something that's used, it's a concept that's used across different disciplines. Uh, intercultural communication, counseling, healthcare, and a little bit different than just a generic sense of empathy, right? So it's being able to put ourselves not just in another person's shoes because we may not have had the same experience, right? But understand that there is a more of a context yeah, using the information that we learn to reflect on what it might be like to experience discrimination what it might be like to see the world through another person's eyes. So, why don't you, let's just take a moment and turn to somebody next to you and share a time where you felt like somebody made an assumption about you, but in an effort to help. Think about a time that you might have experienced that, or if you know of somebody else who's experienced that. And turn to somebody and take a moment. And let's just hear from a couple of people, one or two. Anybody who likes to share briefly their experience of Okay, so we talk, we discuss kind of uh, cultural identity, and I'm from Northern Ireland, but I would identify as Irish. There's been many occasions where someone has made the assumption that I identify as a British person. Um, and I respect people's, you know, view to point, you know, if you want to identify, that's okay. But it's it's very frustrating when someone says, no, but you are. And it's, <laughs> you know, you are British, because you're from Northern Ireland, and that's how it is. And um, it is frustrating, and I never really, you know, it was a light bulb moment when you discussed that. Um, in your slide, um, but it was a light bulb moment where I don't always, you know, think about that when I'm working with a child. It may not be a cultural difference; it might be something else, like a, another difference or a viewpoint um, or a moral that you have. Um, 
when it gets it made me think how important it is to consider that and to be understanding of why people think that way too and make them assumptions. You know, straight away I shouldn't think ill of that person for you know telling me that I am this way, like that's who I am. But it's just to have an understanding of why people might think differently. So that was it was really just having the brain going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. And so you used your personal experience to sort of transfer that sense of empathy to somebody else who might have a different experience. And, and that's what we want to be doing. Because we, we don't have the exact same experiences as our, you know, as our clients, as our supervisors. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. Thanks. One more. Um, I, I was working with a, a group of young women with Down syndrome. And um, I'm half Asian, so I have a, a similar feature, the fold to my eyes, uh, that people with Down syndrome do. And then also I'm short, so I like, have a, a few physical commonalities with people with Down syndrome, but I feel like it, it ends there. But anyway, I was walking with this group of people through this, um, this group of women with Down syndrome across this field. They were, were celebrating a big event that day. Um, at this residential facility, and one of the parents or volunteers, this, this older gentleman, came up to us like all excited, and you know, was kind of like, "Hey guys!" Like really infantilizing, you know, and kind of started giving all the women nuggies on their heads, started rubbing their heads. So yeah, like your eyes are kind of exactly how I felt. Like, <laughs> oh, he's, like he's doing this, but I also knew that he, I didn't mention this part, he was a huge donor to this organization, so I was like, "Oh, oh, oh you know." But then he came over, and just like I was, just like part of the group, like came and gave me a nugget too. Um, so it was like just a double, like, like oh, this like gut punch that he was doing it to them, and then when he did it to me, I was like, oh, I feel even worse that like I allowed that to even happen, you know, to the rest of them. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So you know, you're vocalizing, nodding, right? You're all empathizing with those stories. And as therapists, we of course would naturally empathize and, and have developed that empathy, but sometimes in new situations, you know, unfortunately I'm seeing many of my colleagues um, not have cultural empathy for certain uh, students. I had one colleague of mine had a student who, an African American student who was talking about racism that she experienced and behind closed doors, my colleague said, well, I know for a fact that she's never experienced any racism before. And this is somebody that really should know better. So we just have to, you know, we have habitual and automatic reactions. It's just important for us to keep coming back to this. So, Humility. I put a picture of um, these two, Dalai Lama and um, Desmond Tutu, on here because I feel like they really demonstrate this quality of humility. So one of the things that the Dalai Lama says is that even though he's 80 years old, he still considers himself a student. An amazing amount of humility and. Having humility, culture, especially in social cultural situations, allows us to remember that it's okay to keep learning. It allows us to continue to learn. And this concept has come about kind of in response to the term cultural competence, which was around for a really long time and you may be familiar with. And the criticism of competence was, well, <laughs> It sounds sort of like an end point. How do you know when you're competent enough and ready to go out and practice? You know, so what I like about cultural humility is that it's defined as a process rather than a skill that can be mastered. It's a lifelong commitment to self-reflection, awareness, open-mindedness, mutual empowerment, and humility. So, we just have to be careful that, you know, many of us may be from another country of marginalized background. Some of us may have traveled abroad and learned a lot about one or two different countries, right? Like there's always more to learn. So it's really important that we come from a place of humility. 
and that includes myself. And this perspective that I'm sharing with you today, this is just one perspective. This is just my perspective. I'm on that journey too. So I kind of put these two qualities, self-reflexivity and cultural responsiveness under this category of spirit. I'm defining spirit very broadly as basically finding the, a greater meaning, having a larger perspective. So it's not necessarily religious if you're, if you're not a spiritual person. But the idea is that we make sure that we look at a systemic perspective. Um, I like the way that the Dalai Lama and um, Desmond Tutu wrote this book. Well, they didn't write it, but they're quoted in it. The Book of Joy I've been reading recently. And I found it very inspiring. And they talk about, Tutu talks about, well, having a God's eye perspective. <coughs> and for me, I don't generally use the term God, but thinking of a universal perspective, looking at a situation, maybe a conflict or um, a difficulty that you're trying to figure out with somebody that you're working with, stepping back and looking, seeing it from, looking at the earth from space, looking at it from the point of view of the history of the universe. Right, so it kind of helps us have this perspective of, well, what does this really mean if I think about it from this really big perspective? And another aspect that I put under spirit is around spiritual growth or personal growth. So essentially, self-reflexivity or social cultural reflexivity, I put this under here because I consider it an important part of personal growth, right? We have to challenge ourselves for our evolution as therapists to be able to grow as, as creative arts therapists and, and healthcare practitioners. We have a responsibility to know what's happening deeper inside of ourselves, to learn what's out of our awareness that might be impacting <coughs> the people that we work with that we're not aware of. Um, so some of you may be familiar with these uh, list of privileges that Peggy McIntosh many years ago listed in an article called um, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack White Privilege. So she listed very specific day-to-day -day ways that she had advantages over <coughs> Uh, marginalized groups who are not white. And so I put some different categories up here. It's not just about racial privilege, but you know, my children are given tests and classes which implicitly support our kind of family unit. Do not turn against my choice of domestic partnership. Right? So that's a privilege that it's an advantage. Not everybody can say that. Right? So there's a whole list of them. She lists about 40 plus. So I really encourage you to look that up. Make a, start making a list if you've not done this already. Start making a list of the ways that you have advantages over your clients, your students, the supervisees. It's really, it's a really powerful practice. And it's it's not easy. You know, it's not an easy one. I I was not able to really be aware of my privileges until, you know, I was, I don't know, in my 30s or something. I, I first really had to deal with my own internalized depression around some of my other identities. And once I did that, I was, I had kind of enough, um, you might say self-compassion for myself to be able to look at these and make this list and say, wow, yeah, I, I don't have to worry about paying my bills. You know, and there's a client that I worked with many years ago who was white, and one day um, she had lost her, her husband had died. One day she came in and she started um, blaming people of color for taking all the welfare. She tried to get on welfare. She said, they're taking, people of color are taking all the welfare. I can't get on, I'm being discriminated against because I'm white. 
child and in a session with me, and I was really shocked and nervous. Actually, this isn't my internship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and fortunately, I had started a meditation practice, and otherwise, I don't know what I would have done. I just breathed, and I just listened to her, and, and what I realized, once I just let her speak and actually refocused her back on her feelings, she started talking about what she was really scared about, losing her mobile home. It was the winter time. She had to pay for her, the military was supposed to pay for her husband's burial, and they weren't doing that. Right, and so, that was like a really good, it was a really important lesson for me, and I realized, wow, I'm privileged <coughs> mentally, I have more privilege emotionally, psychologically, physically, because she also had like some physical issues going on with her knee, educationally, socially, economically. Like it was very clear to me. So I invite you to take that risk and do some journaling around that. So another area, which is probably heard lots about, some of you may have watched this video before, I'm just going to show you briefly. Um, <laughs> right, so this is a, obviously a spoof um, video on microaggressions. Microaggressions, some of you may hopefully are familiar with this, right? Subtle, covert, unconscious forms of oppression in the form of slights or insults. And most of the time, you know, it happens all the time. We all engage in microaggressions, but we, a lot of times, we don't realize that we're, we're doing that, right? It's not intentional, intending to be hurtful. So, I don't know if you can see those at the top of there, but I put a few microaggressions. The where are you really from? I've been asked that question probably thousands of times in my life, right? So that actually. I was not exaggerating the very beginning of the, of the video. I'm, I'm sure some of you have experienced that as well. Um, your English is so good. Another very common microaggression. I've, I've also been told the same thing many, many times, even though I, I grew up learning my first language. Um, the, other, the others that I put up there, if you can't see them, you should wear dresses more often. Who's the man in your relationship? Right? For, uh, same sex relationships. What are you? What are you? People often ask that for people who may be um, mix, of mixed race or who are transgender, gender binary, non, sorry, gender non binary. So those are some common microaggressions. And, you know, they're small, right? Um, obviously, it was exaggerated in the video, but. They're small, and so I think it's sometimes we can tend to think, well, I didn't really mean it, I didn't intend it that way, right? But the issue, I think what the issue is, is one of my colleagues, Natasha Thomas, who's a music therapist in our region in Indiana, uh, described microaggressions as a scratch, right? So if you, if you just get one tiny little scratch, no big deal, it's just gonna heal by the end of the day, maybe. Right? But if if you have many different scratches over the course of a week or months or days, or the same one will gets deeper and deeper, right? It doesn't get a chance to heal. I thought that was that's a really good way of describing microaggressions. And also we have to realize that underneath, very often there is unconscious bias underneath. Right, so in the video, he, he was asking that question and sort of um, saying, oh, implying that she's not from that area, right? Implying that she doesn't belong here. The implication is, well, you, you don't look like you belong here. Um, but there's some exoticism too, right? He, at the very beginning, I don't know if you noticed, but he, he was sort of looking her up, body up and down. So maybe there was some fraction, but then, you know, oh, who's this exotic person? And, you know, we don't know exactly what he's thinking, but I'm just making some guesses. 
So, and then he reduces Korean culture to very superficial, um, you know, terminology and food and things like that, when it's obviously just like everybody's background, very rich, complex, and, you know, maybe she, maybe she hates her family, maybe she hates Korean culture and her kids do, you know, who knows? So, a lot of assumptions, right? And so another way that we can demonstrate the self-reflexivity is through admitting our biases, self-reflecting. Wow, you know, wow, I, wow, I didn't really like that person when they, when they said that to me when they came in the room, and, and I wonder why that is. And when we have privilege as a supervisor or an educator or a therapist, and we already have a privilege to, you know, we have the power to diagnose them, hospitalize them, influence their emotional state, right? So these, our social cultural backgrounds add additional layers of advantages and ways that um, we have to be extra careful of. Well, so responsiveness, I'll just say this briefly. I put responsiveness as one of these six qualities and I'm considering responsiveness as kind of the larger umbrella that's in, encompassing all these different areas that we've been talking about. Okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that. So this is a song. Um, hopefully, you're all. I'm going to invite you all to sing with me. I'm going to teach it to you, and we're going to talk about a little bit about it first. I yo. This is a song that this woman, Timana, who is an educator from New Zealand, taught to the participants in the New Zealand Music Therapy Association Conference, which I spoke at several years ago and had the opportunity to go there and, and visit. And she wrote this song specifically for music therapists. She's a Maori person and it's in Maui, and there's a translation here. And so she wanted something to sort of give us this, send us off with this really wonderful feeling. And you can see the message, you know, she's wish wishing music therapists, and we'll send that to creative arts therapists and healthcare practitioners, peace, tranquility, you know, to take care of ourselves and maintain our well-being. Um, so it's a really feel-good song. It's a really wonderful song, right? But before we sing it, if we just think about these different qualities that we talked about, and so we already know, okay, wow, this is a different language. This is a different culture. You might even think, wow, cool, Maori, New Zealand, so exciting. And, um, so let's just look at the information, right? It's um, because one of my colleagues, another one of my colleagues, Hakeem Leonard, he's a music therapist, teaches at Shenandoah University um, at a Black Music Therapy Network recently, he said, you know, music therapists, we tend to kumbaya a little too soon, mm -hmm. right? We, we tend, we want to jump towards that positive feeling and universal connection right away, and sometimes it's very appropriate and sometimes it's a little too soon. Recognize that you know clients are likely to go there. So the first thing is, right, in indigenous cultures and communities, it's important to ask permission and get have permission before using anything. So we know we already have permission to sing this song and enjoy it and share it. And in terms of the knowledge, gaining knowledge about about these people, right? The Maori are Polynesian people um, with a long history of colonization and displacement by Europe. Um, they were over centuries, right? Several centuries manipulated and forced into selling their land at low prices to the British government. Very similar to what happened to the Native Americans there's not quite as much genocide, but many were killed um, 
to wars in wars between the British and the indigenous people. Um, they lost a lot of people due to diseases that they were exposed to, lost a lot of land, lost a lot of their culture. Um, the, the nice thing about what's happening in New Zealand is that there is a revival of indigenous um, you know, practices, indigenous people, indigenous communities in New Zealand, and there's a lot of resiliency happening there. Maori is, is an official language of New Zealand, along with English, bicultural country, which is we don't have anything close to that here. They have received reparations, including land, they have political representation, you know, so so they're definitely ahead of where we are. Um, so that's a bit of background. Okay, so all right. I'm ready to try it out. Yeah. Okay, first of all, uh, Temana was very particular about the way that we pronounced Maori. Okay, so it's Mao, there's like an O, and then there's a rolled R. So let's try that. Maori. Right, Maori. So repeat after me. Ayo. Ayo. Maori Tao. Maori Tao. Ayo. Ayo. Good.
Yes, I'm, I'm editing a book with one of my colleagues, music therapy colleagues there, so I talked to her probably last week. Um, there is a Wellington and I'm Christchurch, but I know that she's the director of the music therapy program there, and I know that they've had a lot of discussions on campus and in town, and so, yeah. You know, the entire country is talking about it. Do you mean that if people are using creative arts as healing and things like that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I know that she's in a training program, and so, um, so she's, they're using that with their students. They're uh, discussing it for sure. Hi, um, I'm a music therapist, and I have been, you're, you're little, um, journaling exercise for a quick second about um, looking at what your privilege is. Like, would you stop for a second and talk about the people that I work with? I work with kids who either on the autism spectrum or kids who have attention deficits have hard time sitting still. And I think of myself as being a privileged person who can sit still. And I'm working with kids who can't. I am a person with a healthy brain, working with people with brain injury. I'm a person who's never experienced trauma, working with people who are going working through their trauma, and sometimes it makes me feel like kind of ineffective as a therapist because it's hard to gain their trust sometimes, and I feel like I can't completely empathize with what they've been through, and that it's always come easy for me to live life without those hurdles. So, I don't know, can you talk to that piece? Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> So what are the ways that we can learn more about what it's like for like the clients that you described um, and people from any group, kind of groups that we haven't had similar experiences with is, well, through immersion, through immersing ourselves in those communities. Now, as a therapist, you might feel like you already are, um, but, you know, I would, the thing is, do we have friends, do we have community circles with some of these people that we get to know their experiences, do we, do we go out with, you know, a group of people with autism and, and um, go to the movies and see what their experience is like? Right. So in terms of cultural differences, it's, it's probably a little more clear cut because there's a lot of discussion about cultural immersion being important even traveling to another country. It gives you that kind of right in your face experience of, oh my goodness, everybody's operating in a different way and speaking a different language and, and, and you're nobody's making that contract or everybody's hugging me or you know what I mean? It's, the differences are very obvious and so cultural immersion is a really great way to get a sense of what it's like. And um, so I would suggest that's a little trickier because you're a therapist and you're working with these groups, but you know, befriending people with these different experiences with um, with autism, um, going to some community groups, um, open, of course, open to the public, and and getting to know people on a personal level, it, it makes such a huge difference when we see it right in front of us. I I'm reminded um, when I first moved to Boulder, Colorado, which is a Wonderful, beautiful, exciting place, and it's also very homogenous. It's a very white town, and I was very kind of self-conscious about that when I first moved there. And my partner at the time uh, was white, he's a white man, and we went to the grocery store, and I was ahead of him in line, sort of checking out, and there was a woman in front of me with blonde hair, um, blue white. And the cashier um, was super friendly to her and smiling and asked her how her day was. And, and then as soon as I got to the, the, the you know, checkout, um, 
you know, she stopped smiling. She didn't say anything to me. And, and that kind of thing, it happens all the time. And it happens to me a lot. And I didn't really pay that much attention to him. I thought, oh, well. And he was behind me, a few people. And after we got out of the store, he said, did you see what that woman did to you? I can't believe that. You know, she didn't even smile at you. She smiled and talked to the person in front of you. And she didn't do that to you. And what's wrong with her? He was outraged, you know. And that was the, kind of the first time, because it was the first time he'd been in an interracial relationship. It was the first time he'd ever seen anything like that before. And so when we're with people, you know, in close, either in another country or, we, you know, like a community group, we learn those kinds of things, and that's it's one way to really develop empathy. Besides, you know, listening to stories, right? There's a, a, a neurotypical movie I found really helpful. I'm sure many of you know about that. It was on Netflix for a while. People telling their stories, right? Listening to those stories really helps us develop that empathy. And just learn. It just takes time to learn about entirely new groups of people if we've never had that experience. So be patient. <laughs> and persistent. Do you believe in calling out the behavior in the interest of educating that person who's expressing a microaggression, or more bigger than micro, um, in the hopes that it, it's an educational thing? And as a therapist, would it be appropriate and empowering to help the client get that uh, skill uh, to, if we were looking at the movie, she called him out real well. That, <laughs> that woman let him know in many ways. But she, she didn't actually have to say to him, didn't choose to, my goodness, you have just acted on the basis of so much bias, prejudice, ignorance, blah, blah, blah. She didn't say that. Um, so, yeah. So are you asking, should we teach our clients from marginalized communities to call out these <coughs> behaviors when they experience Yes. Them? Well, <laughs> I can't just think of another question. It's a good question. And I would say it's a, it's a little bit more complex, right? It depends on who we are, what's our relationship to them. Have we ever done that before? Have we been in a position to call out other people's microaggressions? And I think if we call, call on our own experience, it might make sense, and is it the appropriate um, strategy to the client based on their whole clinical right, right. profile and what they need? So it certainly could be part of empowering client, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do that if. I would be careful about doing that, right? If it was somebody who had a lot less privilege than me. I mean, most of, most of our clients do, but has, in terms of different social cultural identities. I would be careful about that, and I practice in a humanistic way, and so I would sort of let them lead. And, and I think it depends on your theoretical orientation as well, but you know, just I would be self reflective about that. <laughs> For the supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So this is a bit of a personal question to you. Um, so as an aspiring art therapist, um, I feel the need to collect as many tools as possible. So in terms of self-care, what do you do for those who experience uh, cultural insensitivity? Um, not only for myself, but also for my clients. So if anyone were to experience um, multiple microaggressions and they're coming to the session and only want to talk about that, what tools or what type of self-care should I provide in your experience? 
systems that are going to help them deal with racism if if that's what they're dealing with they're dealing with racism whatever isms they're dealing with they need support systems to help them deal with that in their daily life so just like we help them have support in all kinds of other ways i would help them develop some of these support systems who else do they have in their life that they can call or call up on when these things are happening to help them validate it, help them feel validated so that they don't internalize it, right? So again, if it depends on the dynamic, the privileges that we have in relationship to our clients. Um, but right, we, want, we definitely want to help them not in, continue to internalize these. And that's where the identity development, I feel like, is really helpful because if you, if you know anything about it or if you decide to investigate it, there's a lot of information about how you can help somebody, what they need in, in a particular stage, right? So if somebody is experiencing racism, but, they, but they're kind of denying it and they're maybe not ready to go there, we need to help them in a different way. Right? We need to help them get the support. Maybe they need support in other ways. Maybe their mental health issues or physical or um, neurodiverse issues are a higher priority and they need to feel more secure in that before they're ready to face these other areas. Right? And then if it's somebody who's actively in that third stage of you know, anger and um, uh, rage about what's happening and, and what they're experiencing, then absolutely, right? They're ready to have tools, and they and they might need and benefit from tools about how how they can channel that energy. What can they do? How can they act and be involved and and write letters or speak up for themselves that will help them feel more empowered? They're ready to do that. So it kind of depends on what place they're in, right? And, and I do a lot of work around ethnic identity assessment, and I think that that's what we need to be assessing because that's what your question is. And so if we assess them first based on these different models, we'll have a better idea about how to help them in these, in these areas. So, um, I'm not sure if you have a question about the question, but I just struggled a lot how to handle different political opinions that come up. I try to avoid politics in every case, but because of different group members really perseverating or really being interested in politics, it comes up a lot. And I find it hard to just shut it down. So it becomes a conversation and when my beliefs and opinions are very strong difference than some of the clients. I'm not sure how to really facilitate that discussion. Um, I feel like some clients influence other clients and it becomes just a huge situation. So I guess the biggest part is when I have very different beliefs than a client, what do we do in a group setting? <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> well, so you brought up a few different points, and my feeling is, and there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people talking about this, and a lot of liter some literature coming out in creative arts therapies now. But my feeling is, you know, the social, cultural, political is not separate from what's happening to our clients, right? Because they're they're dealing with all these systemic policies and laws that are that are changing or being threatened and and it directly impacts them so so that's the first piece that you talked about essentially what's the role of politics in therapy 
it obviously it depends on what they're there for as well. And we don't want them to channel what they need to be focused on into just an external political argument, which is not going to help them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really, we should be leading the way. And this is not something that I was taught in graduate school, and it was something that I gradually realized and learned and learned from other people, other teachers and mentors in different disciplines, that, that we, one thing that is really can be very supportive and empowering for our, our, the people we work with is to lead the discussion, to locate ourselves at the beginning of our therapeutic relationship. So at the beginning, just like you introduced yourself, I didn't have you introduce yourself with pronouns or identities, but to bring those into the room, um, to identify yourself and say, you know, this is who I am and it informs the, it impacts the therapy that we do together, the artwork or the movement that we do together. And um, depending on, well, and yeah, and then asking them, they don't have to reveal anything they want to, but asking them what it's like you know, in terms of building trust. Oh, have you ever had a therapist who's white or black or queer before? Um, what's, what's that like for you? What's that experience like? And so that's, in a group setting, slightly different. But if we take the lead of those discussions, then first of all, we can address biases and microaggressions from the beginning, um, hopefully, if they will reveal them, but as part of building trust, it should come up. Groups are a little more complicated, because, uh, you know, it depends on who your group, who's in your group, and maybe we can talk about that more later, but I would still um, lead, uh, lead a discussion around it. You could ask, well, what is, how do all these politics and things happening in, in around, um, around our world, how does that impact your lives here and what we do here? Does it, is there, does it have any relevance or does it not? And you could help them have a discussion about it, but then you are leading it rather than reacting to, oh my gosh, they're saying something that's offensive to a lot of people, what do I do? And does that make sense? <laughs> I wish we could just talk for a 